Thank you so much for being here with me tonight, uh, tonight in the UK and this morning where you are. Aubrey, it's a pleasure to have you in this group. Well, it's an honor to have you on this group and it's a great joy to go and listen to you, I think, because I think many people here probably know who you are, but maybe there are some people on this side of the ocean who don't know yet who you are. Uh, I bet it's not possible. <laughs> uh, I still remember, you know, when you have opened the Facebook group Montessori 101. I still remember, you know, the first post you shared on the Montessori teacher group, yeah. you know, expecting that you wanted to reach more parents and you believe that it was a great idea to, to uh, you know, start to uh, talk more about Montessori with parents, uh, being a teacher yourself. I really remember that first post and coming, you know, like totally new on your group and starting that group, uh, you know, being one of the first on your group and when we see what what it has become you know it's a great achievement and i suppose you are yourself very proud <laughs> <laughs> and not just you and nicole as well obviously because you didn't stay the early admin for long i think nicole came came into the the group quite quickly after you and you know the rest is history as we say right <laughs> yeah i think nicole was like the first person who actually i invited which which um is kind of fun that she ended up being a co-admin um and amy as well it's been really neat to get to work with those two people um and i really love what i really really love about the group is that it's global and it's just amazing that we can reach so many more people than we used to. The Montessori community used to be so small and it's still close knit. Like we still have the, the philosophy that we adhere to, um, but it's, it's, I think it's grown so, so much more with social media. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, it's like, I, I like you, you know, our children have, uh, similar age so obviously like 10 11 years ago when we wanted to find something about Montessori they were like two or three blocks yeah and uh, we were probably among the first blocks you know <laughs> ourselves and uh, it was like you know you were chatting with someone and you were chatting like maybe with 10 people and nowadays it's amazing the number of parents who are interested uh, by the Montessori education and who are trying to do something with Montessori and what I think is also amazing is to have so many you know Montessori teacher deciding to reach more parents and to help parents to really understand what is the monster education and you know to help with the misconceptions that all parents have uh, and obviously that are spread by by us by parents because of social media when we share you know shelfie and a lot of toys and so on and it's great to see you know all the monster teacher deciding to Say okay, no. Let me tell you how it works really in real life. You know, uh, for us who are trained, and for any other parents who are not trained, that's the same ultimately. So great. Yes. So, do you well, want to start to tell us a bit more about you as parent and Montessori teacher? You know, just a bit more about you, your family, and uh, Montessori came into your life. Sure. Um, well, my name is Aubrey Hargis. To those of you who don't know me yet, um, my website is childoftheredwoods.com. So um, my name is Aubrey, and I live in San Francisco, California right now. I have two boys. They're elementary age right now. I have an eight-year-old. Actually, he would say, not eight, eight and a half. And I have an 11-year-old who would say 11 and a half. Um, so one, right? in the spot of the second plane, just right in the middle of that, and one on the edge coming out of the second plane into the third, into that adolescent phase. Um, and so I feel like it's been fun to witness their growth since they were babies in Montessori all the way up through now, and I'm excited to see the transitions that are coming for us. Um, I'm all, also a homeschooler, so I am with my children full time at home. Uh, and I work uh, in the Montessori community as a parent coach um, at the same time, and I can do that online and at home. And so it works for our family to be able to homeschool. Um, and we love what we do. I, I feel like every time I ask my children, you know, do you like being homeschooled? They say, yeah, we, we love working with you. And we love being able to get out and to go to parks and 
Um, and so it's just working for us right now. And I, I do remember that you explained that it was not your first choice that when your little boy, you know, was like uh, at the age to enter the monastery school, basically, you had to move, basically. And so you couldn't if yeah. there were no monastery school where you were going, which is the case for many parents, obviously, but there are, there are other way to apply monastery at home. You know, homeschooling is one of the way, obviously, yeah. and you're doing that very well. <laughs> okay. So I do know as well, I think you have explained that your own mother, is a Montessori teacher, right? Yes. And then um, you went to Montessori school <laughs> yourself. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. So um, my childhood was, was a little bit unique. I grew up in a very a small rural town in Texas in the United States. Um, and for those of you who don't look, know what that's like, it was kind of prairie land, very small little town. Um, we moved there, and that's kind of where I grew up. And in that town was a little preschool. Uh, it was actually a Montessori school that was inside a little church. Just they had rented out a little room. I think a lot of Montessori schools kind of get started that way. They find an available space to have a little classroom. And some friends of my mother's all told her, like, we're, we're going to sign up for this program. It's even just a few days a week. It starts at age three. Uh, and we all have three-year-olds. Let's uh, send our kids to the school together. And we can carpool and take them there and trade off caring for them. Um, and so my mother got on board and signed up. Uh, it wasn't a very expensive uh or prestigious little preschool. It was just like a little kind of home-like school uh, in a little classroom. And that was my very first introduction to Montessori. Uh, and I loved it. I loved going. Um, what I remember, I don't remember a whole lot about the materials in that preschool classroom, but what I remember is the feeling of being free to walk about and to not have this pressure, this outside pressure on me to achieve and to be the best at uh, any academics or anything. I just remember this, this wonderful feeling of being comforted and supported in this little environment where I was allowed to just choose what I wanted to be interested in and to do. Um, and so that was my first start. And I didn't even stay at that little school for the full three years. You know, I talked to a lot of parents, uh, and I usually recommend if you're going to do a Montessori preschool, go for a five-day-a-week mornings, like at least three-hour time block in the mornings, five days a week program, uh, because its consistency is really, really good for the children. But I didn't have that myself when I was little, um, and I still enjoyed it, and I still feel like I really benefited from it. And during my, my third year for that preschool, kinder, it would be the kindergarten year, which is what we call it in the United States, um, I did not attend that same little classroom. I actually went to a classroom that a mom, a, a parent who had become Montessori certified as a teacher, had in her own little home. And so she had her living room, and then there was a little room offshoot area kind of connected to her house. It was a big farmhouse in Texas. So she had cows, and there was a big garden outside, uh, and it was definitely like a home environment. And so that was the classroom that I went to during my third year. And my biggest memory of that one is having all this time to read. I love to read, and she had this extensive library and she would just let me go in there and just sit and read to my heart's content and so um that was that was my probably my best memory of that experience and then from there uh, i moved to an elementary montessori school in a different town we moved to a nearby small town and um i would stayed there until about third grade so that's about age nine and i really enjoyed that experience too and at that point when i was nine years old that was when uh, kind of my options for Montessori ended in my particular area without going outside into a big city or um, another area. But in my town, that was kind of the transition point for me to transition into the public school system. And so that's what I did. I entered fourth grade uh, as a Montessori, a previous Montessori student entering into the public school system. And in my area, the, the school was really, really different. Um, I went from this experience where I felt empowered to educate myself 
to an experience where I was expected to sit in a desk <laughs> for you know hours and hours a day and not talk unless I raise my hand um, and to do lots and lots of worksheets. And so for me, I, I kind of feel like Montessori brought me this sense of, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's entitlement. I felt entitled <laughs> to be able to initiate my own education and to study the things I was interested in. And so I was resentful of the change out of Montessori, but I still wasn't unsuccessful with the experience transitioning. You know, I, I handled it. Um, and I think most Montessori kids who grow up in a Montessori school and then transition into a different environment are pretty well equipped to transition and just handle the new experience because we're brought up to be flexible in that way, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, at that be. point, my mother and those uh, other parents who had originally gotten together to send us at three, age three to the little preschool, they all got together and decided to go take their Montessori training together and to start a school. And so it was really impactful for me to watch my mother take an educational journey of her own. As I was transitioning out of the Montessori school, she was transitioning into the role of, of teacher. And so I remember that year she came home every day from, you know, she would come from her classes all inspired about education and she would want to share the materials and, and practice the lessons on me um, and share with me what she had learned. And so my Montessori training began when I was nine <laughs> and just like <laughs> with my mother as she went through this training. And so even though I never have received my certificate, my certificate in three to six, so dabbled in so many other areas, um, but I feel like that is my grounding was in the three to six age group. And it just um, yeah. came from my family life. Yeah. So do you think that you were raised differently with a mom? who was, you know, who became a Montessori teacher. She was not a Montessori teacher in the early years. No. So maybe she was not, you know, thinking that much about what to do differently at home. Uh, because it's the case for many parents. They send their children to a Montessori school, but then they don't really think about the difference, what they could do differently at home. Uh, because many parents also choose uh, the, the Montessori education for the academics as well. Uh, but maybe, you know, obviously your mom was very interested, so maybe she was already, you know, trying to give you as much independence as possible at home, or I don't know. So if you want to, uh, you know, maybe your impression of your childhood, if you feel that you mom or maybe your parents were doing something different because of that Montessori, uh, you know, approach, uh, they were they are chosen for your education. That would be very interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think that our view of what Montessori should look like at home is skewed because of what we see on Pinterest and Instagram from parents who are intentionally trying to follow Montessori principles today now that we have all this knowledge about it. Uh, and so I can tell you that my environment at home did not look like a Pinterest Montessori home. Uh, my, you know, in fact, um, my mother, you know, like we had lots of toys and a big playroom. Uh, I had lots of access to the outdoors, uh, lots of unstructured time, but there was not like an overt uh, prepared home environment in the way that I think that parents have access to now. Um, it was more about the philosophy I think that my parents, my father was a psychologist, and he still is. Um, my mother was retired, and so she's once a Montessori teacher, always a Montessori teacher. Um, but I think, that, I think that Maria Montessori herself studied psychology, uh, and at her time, it was a new and burgeoning field. She was very interested in Freud, uh, and so I feel like modern psychology and child development really mesh very, very well. And so in my upbringing, child development and child psychology was a, a big deal. Uh, and so my parents, even though they were new to Montessori as new parents themselves, they were very interested in what was be most beneficial for emotional and social well-being. And I feel like that is something that we really emphasize in Montessori education. And so that was a natural fit. And so for me, I feel like my Montessori education at home 
was more about my parents respecting my opinion and my point of view and asking me whether I wanted to do something or whether, you know, how I felt about doing something before making that decision for me. I always felt respected and included in the family decision making. Um, and I think that if we can start with that, then parents are well on their way toward having a Montessori home already, even if they don't have a pretty shelf and the right toys you know, to put on it um, and a beautifully prepared space otherwise. I feel like if that is the heart that comes first, then you know the rest is, is just kind of icing on the cake. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's very important what you have said about the philosophy and the principles behind, you know, the aesthetic. And that's totally what we do in our own family. You know, I have a background in psychology. So yeah. obviously child development was my thing. When my first child was born, I was like observing her and observing every yeah. milestone. And um, I discovered Montessori because uh, I came upon a book that was all about the freedom of movement. More more about Pickler and Luxy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, in France, that was kind of a big movement uh, in the child psychology field. So I was very aware of that even before I had my children uh, when I did my uh, master in psychology. And so I came back to it very quickly after I had my first child because it was so important for me to respect my child development. So very quickly I came upon, you know, um, Montessori during this research and yeah. definitely the principles is something that the freedom of choice and giving choices to our children what is really what what define our family i think more than the toys more than the shelf yeah uh, definitely i had more you know i was more into that when my children were three and under six when they were toddlers and so on but you know like 10 years ago you couldn't find those beautiful toys everywhere no. you know the brand we had access to were like melissa and do and that was all <laughs> you know that was the wooden toys of the time right. uh, so i definitely didn't have uh, the baby mobiles uh you know any specific Montessori toys at least for my first for my first uh, child who is 11 so i'm going into that first stage as well <laughs> So I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. <laughs> I will be there before you, I think. But um, yeah, I think that's very important to remind those principles and the philosophy behind, you know, the aesthetic and the pretty shelves, as you say. And that's something that I really love in the work that you're doing, is that you insist on that. Great. Uh, so, well, we're going to chat about your book. I can see that behind okay. you. If you want to share the cover of Baby Milestone, you can <laughs> for oh, everyone. Okay. But I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is the very first. I wrote two books last year. It was, uh, I had no idea I could do such a thing. So, this is Baby's first few milestones. So, yeah, that's a big thing, isn't it, to have written your first book, but you didn't even write one book. You wrote <laughs> two books last year. Right. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to see what's coming next this year. <laughs> <laughs> no books this year. <laughs> You're taking a break. <laughs> okay, so. Exactly. Yeah, so tell me, why did you write a book specifically about babies and also you know, obviously you explained that you are a Montessori teacher in that book, but it's not, you know, all about Montessori on every page. It's much more about the baby development. Obviously, when we know you, when we know that you are a Montessori teacher, when we are a Montessori teacher, also, when we read that book, we do know that, uh, you know, we know about the Montessori influence in the book. But if you don't know anything about Montessori, you can read that book and you will learn as much. So I. Yeah, just let me know why did you write a book about babies and that specific book, obviously. Well, um, as a brand new parent myself, when I had my very first baby, I, you know, I, I was a very anxious parent and I was concerned about a lot of things. Everything was new to me. Even though I had a monastery background, I didn't necessarily know a lot about uh, what babies needed or how to be a parent to one. And I found that any of the books that I was reading that talked about the development of babies and how to help your baby, they often had, um, 
they often had points of view that were more medical oriented. Like everybody knows the what, you know, what to expect when you're expecting or in, in babyhood type of series. Uh, and there's one in the Mayo Clinic that gives a lot of good information. But again, it's kind of all medical and mainstream focus. And my agenda <laughs> has always been to get Montessori out of the Montessori niche and more out into the mainstream world. Because I feel like when we really look at what Maria was teaching us, she isn't teaching us something that is outside of general good child development knowledge. You know, she's not teaching us something about education that needs to be special or different and separate away from the mainstream education world. Uh, the principles that we learn in Montessori are based on psycho modern psychology and child development. Uh, and so they apply to all children, not just Montessori parents. Um, and so I feel like we can get trapped in our little niche and we, it feels very comforting to be inside this nice little Montessori community of like-minded people. But in reality, I really feel like all children should have um, the benefit of being respected and understood developmentally right from birth, you know, all over the world. And so I feel like, so I, I purposefully, this book is not written. This is obviously uh, a book written by a Montessorian. <laughs> you know, I, I really, I just can't write anything that's not Montessori because as we talked about, it's just kind of in my blood. It's what I talk about, it's what I study, it's what I do. But I want these principles to get out there to more people, to reach more people. And so this book is um, has, has a whole lot of Montessori activities in it. Uh, just by nature, the, these kinds of activities are good for children and good for their child development. And so my purpose in this book is to try to calm down the anxious parent, because I feel like when we first have a baby, we don't really know what to do. We're looking for outside advice. There are lots and lots of voices out there telling us, you should do only this with your baby. You should only, um, you know, like you should sleep train your baby between this and this age. If you don't, this terrible thing is gonna happen. Uh, and so I wanted to write a book that was more calming and more open-ended and more accessible to the general public, but still, very true to Montessori principles. Well, you did very well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, also in that book, you know, all the ideas that you offer to the parents to um, stimulate the child and are so simple. Okay, there is no need for expensive toys uh, yep. when you read that book. So obviously, you have seen as well, like me, you know, the rise of so many Montessori toys yes. all over and so many you know Montessori inspired activities trades and materials and everything uh, can be labeled Montessori nowadays and uh, you know I'm from Belgium and so from from French speaking countries and in France it's like every little uh, brand you know has decided to have the Montessori line of toys there was you know I never seen so many toys that are branded Montessori, or uh, books that are branded Montessori, or uh, you know, workbook, worksheet book uh, for children that are branded Montessori, and it become a bit ridiculous. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to have a bit of your opinion about all of that. Yeah. What do you think about all of these Montessori toys and material? I would say, and um, how to reassure parents about what they need or do not need. <laughs> so I feel like the popularity of Montessori has gotten a big push from social media in the past several years. And I feel like it's a double-edged sword. You know, so the more information we share with the public and the more popular the Montessori name gets, the more people are interested and the more companies feel like, oh, maybe this is marketable. Parents are looking for Montessori. And so you have this dilution, you know, this watering down of the philosophy, the method, and the toys themselves. And I feel like, this is just part, <laughs> this is what we deal with when we make Montessori principles more mainstream. And so I feel like mm -hmm. I, when, I, when I was a younger person and a newer teacher, I felt more strongly, I felt angry about it. Like, why are they using the Montessori name to sell things? They're misrepresenting what we do. And all of these Montessori toys online, they're not really Montessori, this is unfair. 
Uh, and I feel like after working in the Montessori community for a long time, I feel like this is a roller coaster that, you know, that we're on. And we really cannot control where it goes, but we can do our part to make sure that parents are allowed, like that they have access to as much quality, high quality education about Montessori as possible. And then it's on them to make sure that, that they are understanding the true nature. And I feel like there are tons of Montessori teachers who are actively for hours and hours every week giving up, you know, vo basically volunteering online to help educate parents about Montessori principles. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful thing. And so even though it's a, a bit of a watering down and a dilution of the method to see so much um, popularity out there, uh, I still feel like it's a good thing for our community, just in, in the yeah. general. So as far as Montessori toys themselves, you talked about the book not um, necessarily needing any special or expensive toys in order to do most of these activities. I feel like with Montessori, we can have, I think that it's fine if you can afford some high quality, lovely materials for your children to explore and play with, whether they're actually Montessori or, or Montessori inspired, you know, if they're beautiful materials that you love, your family treasures, I feel like that is just fine, whether it is a fancy mobile or whether it is the Grimm's Rainbow, which is actually Waldorf-ish, <laughs> but has become popular in the yeah. community. Um, but I feel like where we really need to keep bringing parents in is the why. So why would we want to show children black and white images? And if, uh, you know, and, and also to help educate them that a, a mobile is not the only way to help your child see black and white um, different shapes. And so I feel like it's important that even though we can have value for some of these high quality materials, and we can roll our eyes a little bit about the materials that are maybe not so Montessori, I still feel like it's a good thing in general that there's lots of interest in this philosophy. And if you start out with a little Grimm's rainbow uh, because you think it's inspiring or beautiful and you saw it on Pinterest, maybe this year you'll become inspired enough to read a book like The Secret of Childhood by Maria Montessori. And so I feel like that just drawing people in is a good thing overall. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, as you said, many parents discovered Montessori through the wooden toys and that's good enough. They will they will learn more and you know the wooden toys will be useful for the children anyway. Right. And <laughs> that's it. And as on the same uh you know topic, if they have plastic toys, that's fine as well, as long as they don't overwhelm the children and they're going yeah. to to learn about that as well when they start to discover Montessori, but it's not a reason to throw away all the plastic toys and to to say, okay, no, I need only wooden toys. It's, it's all about the balance, I guess. You know, parents often come into Montessori 101, the group, and they say they want to preference their post by saying, I'm not 100% Montessori. Uh, and my response, yes. I think, uh, I think a lot of people feel like it's an all or nothing type of thing, and it's not. It's just something yeah. that you can study and you can research and become inspired by. Uh, but really, I feel like uh, as long as we are respecting the child, there are many, many ways to incorporate Montessori into our lives at home with children. And there's no reason to feel like uh, just because you don't have all the most beautiful or expensive or are pretty things that you're not a Montessorian in your heart um, if you are really trying to look at respecting your child and observing them and doing what's best for them. Because really all we're trying to do is do what's best for our own children. And children are unique. So what's, what's best for one family or one child isn't necessarily going to look exactly the same. I'm sure you know this living in a different country we all um, around the world, we have different cultural quirks, <laughs> you know, different cultural yeah, absolutely. Montessori goes into all of that because we're looking at the whole child. Of course. Yeah, and uh, talking about respecting the child, uh, well, we're going to chat a bit about your second book okay. <laughs> about the toddler discipline. And 
you know, what do you hear about? What is it for you, the discipline? And obviously, I read the book and I like the way that you were uh, explaining, you know, um, each age. So it was well divided, which I think is very practical for the parents because a one year old is not the same as a three years old, and is the same as a four years old. And uh, yeah, and it's really helpful for parents to have this very practical book like, my child is one, what do I do now? And my child is doing that, what do I do now? Uh, because, you know, we live in a fast paced world when we have little time and we want, we want solutions. And it's kind of understanding that we want solutions. And uh, yeah. as you say, when we are anxious parents, we want to know what to do. And that's probably what we were doing uh, as a, new parents, you know, going on, um, on a Facebook group, uh, on a discussion board before Facebook and asking a question and having someone saying to you, oh, maybe try that. So I feel that your book is a bit like that. And so, yeah, tell me a bit more about that book and what is it for you, you know, how do we discipline <laughs> a little toddler or preschooler? So Montessori yeah. way, but clearly she's not, you know, art discipline, obviously, it's not discipline in the mentoring sense, I guess. Right, yes. So when it comes to discipline, I feel like I have a personal hard line, and that is I don't use rewards or punishments. It doesn't fit in with my, with not just Montessori philosophy, but my personal philosophy um, either. And there's lots of research to say that children who are given too many rewards, uh, will learn to expect those rewards rather than behaving appropriately for a situation for the good of it. Uh, and it's true with, with punishments too. When a child is punished, when they're put in time out, when they are spanked, you know, um, these just bring up feelings of resentment, but it doesn't solve the problem that's going on. And so I feel like these, uh, the rewards and punishments that parents often use are kind of reactive. It's like, my child is, is behaving in a way that's unacceptable. How do I nip it in the bud and just stop it right now? How can I get it to, the behavior to stop? And I think that if we take the time to look deeper into the actual, why is my child behaving that way? And then what are some ways that I can make sure that our relationship is nurtured uh, and to help my child learn what it is that maybe they're lacking or maybe that what they're needing in order to learn, I think that we find ourselves feeling the pressure to use those kind of external uh, rewards and punishments much less, you know, than if we don't look at it from a developmental stage. So again, it's, it's a developmental book, just like the Baby Milestones is. Um, and I feel like a lot of these behaviors parents don't understand are actually normal in childhood and they feel alone like my child's the only one who digs through the trash can at age one uh, or at two why is my child suddenly throwing the remote across the room repeatedly and won't stop doing it you know how do i get them to stop doing it uh, and in a traditional point of view of discipline you might give a child a consequence and say if you throw the remote this bad thing is going to happen to you, or if you don't throw the remote, then I will give you this reward to to get children to stop that. And those can work to solve the to solve the immediate problem, but they don't address they don't address the underlying behavior, which is that children naturally at age two need to throw. <laughs> and so in Montessori, we can come at that from a different perspective, and we can say. Okay, so my child is throwing. So before I figure out how to stop them from throwing this particular thing I don't want them to throw, I need to figure out how to allow them to nurture this developmental need that's going on in them by giving them something different to throw or to help them learn the difference between outside throwing, you know, where you can go throw and where, where it's not socially acceptable to do so. And I feel like the only real exception to this rule is when a child is in a, an immediate dangerous situation. So, and for that, like, if your child is about to stick their hand to the middle of the fireplace, you've got to stop it, <laughs> no matter what. There's no <laughs> time to sit back and observe and say, hmm, what is my child trying to learn? Nope. You've got to go in there and help them be safe. 
But as, as long as they're doing something and it's relatively safe-ish, <laughs> uh, I think that we benefit from allowing our <laughs> ourselves the time to think through what the developmental need of the child is, rather than jumping in right away to just put a stop to that behavior. Is that Does that also yes. align with what you do with your own children at home? Yes, absolutely. I, I think that, as you say, it's understanding your child understanding their needs, understanding what is a uh, normal behavior for the age, absolutely. Yeah. And what we learn as a Montessori teacher is that freedom with the limit, and the limit is the safety of the child, or the right. safety of other people around when they start to, you know, um, hit someone with a big wooden stick for them, it's probably, you know, just trying something new, but for the person <laughs> who's eaten, it's like the, the safety of the other. So that's yeah. just my main rule, it's like, the safety and safety for them and for the other and yeah absolutely and I think that yeah that really sheds a light on a on the main issue with parents and the main you know uh, things that we don't know when we become parents we have no clue about the child development and you know we we give birth we are prepared for the birth normally you know the hospital giving you some courses, some classes about how to give birth, maybe a bit about how to respect your baby and the basics at the hospital about the physical care of the baby. But nobody is going to tell you uh, what is the normal child development of a child. And even when the child is three or four, nobody's telling you, you know, what is the normal development of a child? And it's a shame because we do know, Every, you know, all the psychologists, medical doctors should know as well, nurses, they have um, courses about child development and child psychology. So we should know as well because they are our children and we are the first one taking care of them. And we have to do all the work, okay? If you don't have any background in psychology, you, de you need to do all the work by yourself. And sometimes, yes, indeed, we are misguided because uh, I think nowadays we have more and more books like your book, uh, the book from Simon Davis, and uh, here in the UK we have Sarah O'Quell Smith. You may have come across her, so uh, who has really demystified, uh, you know, the child uh, normal behavior, and you know, um, gentle discipline book is very similar to your on that aspect. And uh, well, I was quite lucky to train with her, so I've learned from her a lot. But it's really that. It's like we didn't have these kind of books, like I think that probably just uh, around six years ago that those books were first published. Or uh, in the state, you have also Dr. Laura Maka, who also published a book probably around six, seven years ago. And until then, I think the books we had were very like about, you know, you know, as you say, uh, punishment and reward and how to control the behavior maybe a kind of kind of gentle way but it was more like a high one hand in a velvet glove right it was like you're going to control your child you're going to give them some sweets or some stickers but at the end of the day we still don't want a child to to act like like a child basically and we still don't understand the underlying needs and we still you know want to have the child just uh letting us be you know having our life <laughs> as before basically something like that and so i think that's super important that more and more people like you and more and more teachers and educators decide to be uh you know to speak up and say okay so we need to do something more for the children right mm -hmm. okay so um well i would like to come back a bit to your homeschooling journey if you don't mind right. Because we have many homeschoolers here, and I think that's so important to have, uh, you know, the testimonial of parents who are much further on the Montessori journey. Uh, because it's quite easy to find so many parents who have children who are just three or four talking about the Montessori journey uh, on social media, or with a two years old saying that, "Oh, I'm homeschooling," but basically that child is not yet, you know, um, even in the mandatory age. Uh, to be to be in school, so it's like difficult for parents to really see. Okay, what's going to happen next? You know, when my child is six, seven, eight, nine, ten, is it okay to still homeschooling and uh, you know having the background of the, um, the experience of someone who has been through that first age? And also, you do a specific homeschooling course. I think that is quite mm -hmm. interesting. For parents who want to dive deeper in the proper monster curriculum and the way you can apply it at home. 
So yeah, if you want to explain to us a bit how you do that at home, maybe how you were doing it to start with when they were young, and how it has evolved now that they are in the second plane. Yeah, so when I started with my firstborn, uh, we did move across the country when he was three and I had a newborn at home. And I had intended to send uh, both of them eventually to the school that I taught in. And I taught uh, um, in the elementary program there and I also taught in the, pro the, the toddler program there with my first when he was very little. Uh, and so I had just intended to take a year off for us to stay at home together while I had a newborn and we were kind of, we would be at home. And then the next year I was planning on sending my first right into the preschool program. Uh, and then my second going into the toddler program and they would just stay there in the elementary, uh, through the elementary years. That was my long-term plan for Monastery. It was in homeschooling. Uh, and on that journey, I think when my youngest was approaching age three, one of the Montessori teachers that I knew, who is a former Montessori teacher and now a stay-at-home mom uh, with a child a little bit older, I think, than mine, uh, she mentioned that she was considering unschooling her children and not sending them to Montessori school. And at the time I thought, what is this about? I would never do that. Uh, I don't know why what, you know why you would want to Montessori school is so wonderful and I've uh, intentionally create like I intentionally settled in this neighborhood and and had this nice relationship with this great school so that I can make this a reality for my children uh, and so it wasn't in my mind at all but it kind of planted the seed <laughs> uh, and she was a wonderful it was a, a wonderful relaxed parent so she was uh, not necessarily a mentor but just somebody that I admired the way she was parenting her own children uh, and then when my child my firstborn turned three years old on his about his third birthday my husband got a call and found out that there was a job opportunity in Alexandria Virginia so all the way uh, we were in Texas, so for those of you who don't know the United States that well, uh, like right in the middle of the United States, southern United States, all the way across the country to the East Coast um, in Washington, D.C. area. And when we moved there, we moved from a regular ranch-style house with three bedrooms and a big backyard uh, into a small apartment in a little town home in uh, a much, much more urban area and a completely different culture than I was used to in Texas. And so it was a bit of a shock when we moved and I had just had a baby, so I was pretty certain about staying home that year anyway. But as I started to think about our realistic options, me staying home, my husband getting this new job, um, so we, we didn't have my income anymore. I had no more relationship with the Montessori school or in the Montessori community in my area. I kind of felt alone and isolated. Um, and I found my way in, into, I had become just newly trained or accredited as a La Leche League leader. I don't know if you have La Leche League there where you are. It's an organization yes. to helping mothers breastfeed. Um, and so I became involved in that community and found that there were other parents, other La Leche League leaders who were also keeping their preschoolers at home and not going to a private school or um, anything. And in that area in particular, it's not like when I was growing up in Texas and my parents could just say, oh, should we or should we not send our daughter to this little preschool down the street? This was more like, if you wanted your child to be in a preschool, you needed to apply in January, go through the admission process, uh, be interviewed as a family, like it just felt like, and then to be able to afford to pay the tuition. And the tuition prices were so much higher than they were in Texas. Um, I just couldn't, my husband and I, we couldn't really conceive of having the ability to suddenly pay this kind of tuition when we had not expected that to be our path. Uh, and so staying home kind of at first felt like, okay, well, I'm doing this. I don't know how to raise a child in the Montessori way at home by myself, even with all the knowledge that I have about Montessori. If Montessori in the classroom is so good, and I know that it, it really can be with the right teacher and the right um, community of families, it can be such a fantastic place for children. 
But if Montessori school is right, then what are my children going to be lacking when I decide, you know, when I don't provide that for them? And so I experienced a lot of difficult emotions. I felt guilty for keeping them out of school during those early years. I felt a lot of um, insecurity, feelings of, you know, just not feeling super confident about my ability to um, school them at home, even during these very young years. And as the years unfolded, I realized that staying home with your preschooler can be really wonderful. Uh, you can not have, you know, you can just kind of not have this pressured, we got to get up and go to school in the morning type of life. You can roll out of bed in the morning and spend your whole morning just puttering around in the kitchen or going wandering outside um, or meeting with other families in the park for hours and hours. And I felt like it was an intentional slowing down of the whole school process for us. And so that's what our early childhood looked like with my own children. They, and I also realized the benefits of having two siblings at home with a, a younger and an older. Um, I got to witness how wonderful it was for them to just have all this time to get to nurture their own relationship with each other. And I found that it really wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be uh, to be able to incorporate Montessori methods, like schoolish type of methods and materials into my home environment. It really just wasn't the, the big deal that I thought it was going to be. And I feel like uh, my children grew out of that phase of life just fine uh, and emerged. And I feel like what grounded us was not necessarily all the Montessori materials. And I'll be honest, as a former kindergarten teacher, I had a lot of materials that I had made for myself uh, when I taught public schools. Um, so I had a, a lot of stuff at my disposal already. And I had a lot of stuff from my mother's classroom, old materials of hers that had gotten worn down and she had passed on to me, I had at my disposal. And I found that I really needed to use them a lot less than I thought that I would need to in, in the beginning. And so when parents come to me and they say, how do I do Montessori without being able to afford all of the expensive materials? Uh, or should I just make all of these parts cards? How many parts cards do I need to devote hours and hours to making? My answer is you really have to have a different mindset when you're doing Montessori in the home as opposed to sending your child to Montessori in a classroom. Both are can be wonderful, but they're very different. So in the, in the classroom, what Maria Montessori did was she tried to bring the children a rich environment into the classroom. And so they were children who did not have exposure to a, a whole lot of worldly knowledge. And so her whole purpose was to bring that knowledge into the classroom. And if something wasn't represented there in that home-like classroom, she would look outside in a way to bring it down to their level, into the room, into their environment. And as homeschoolers, I think we can get trapped by that mentality. We can think we too, because we're homeschooling, need to bring everything into our house. And how are we going to afford to bring everything into our house? And how are we going to fit everything into our house, especially <laughs> a little tiny apartment like I was when my children were very little. Uh, and the answer is, as homeschoolers, we don't need to bring everything in. We need to bring our children out <laughs> into the world. <laughs> so that is what fills in. So parents wonder, like, how do I fill in those blanks, you know, those empty spaces? Like, I, I know my children are missing these things that they would have gotten in the classroom. How do I bring it into my house? And my answer to them is, you don't have to. You bring your children out into the world and there are so many resources out there that you have the ability to go with your children to, to go explore together. Um, that you don't, it's not necessary that you own every single thing that Maria Montessori uh, said that a teacher would need to have in order to have a classroom environment and lots of children inside it in a community. So I feel like it's a different mindset, but totally possible. And I think a lot of parents take different paths there. Some parents take a very minimalist mindset and they're mostly unschooling, Montessori unschooling. Uh, and I think that can be great, like just not buy the materials, find ways for your children to experience those concepts out in the world or in your home in different ways. I think it's perfectly valid. 
And I think that other parents get so inspired and excited and they, they compare the cost of bringing in some quality Montessori materials to the cost of tuition. And they say, you know what? I'm not paying tuition for preschool so I can afford to buy some of these materials and I wanna know which ones are the best to buy. And I think that that's perfectly valid too, way to look at it. And others still are do-it-yourselfers and they say, you know what, I can't afford the expensive materials or maybe I'm the kind of person who likes to make things myself and be creative and <laughs> happy. Uh, and so they spend a lot of their time with them crafting this Montessori environment from scratch. And I think that's another path parents can take that's perfectly valid for them. So you don't have to just pick one way to homeschool. You can incorporate many, many different ways. And I still know homeschoolers will incorporate Waldorf and Reggio Emilia principles. And you don't just have to do 100% of anything. You can make it your own and make what works for your family. Yeah. and that's, um of course, it's not possible to replicate the classroom and the classroom, no. you know, atmosphere because, you know, there are like 20 children and that's what, that's what uh, makes the dynamic of a classroom. So obviously, if parents are obsessed with the fact that they need to recreate a classroom mm -hmm. and so they're going to miss a point and they're not going to be able to, to um, replicate that. Um, you know, dynamics that we have in the classroom. So I think that your approach is, um, you know, makes sense. And I do like that idea that you have, well, not that idea, but that um, uh, mindset to bring the child out. And that's, you know, probably one of the main advantages to homeschool is to have that slow life, do not being uh, on a schedule with your children and to be able to just explore the world. And that's definitely something that I would have love to be able to do um you know my situation is different i needed to go back to work i needed an income i couldn't afford to homeschool so uh, my children came with me to my classroom as the first in the early years so part-time with me and part-time in the classroom mm -hmm. and um then at some point uh we had the possibility to, to send my youngest to a local Montessori school and that meant that i had to leave my own job as a Montessori teacher because it was totally in the opposite direction and it's not as big as the uh, United States in the UK but I couldn't do both uh, so yeah no I work for myself to be able to afford the tuition but I'm very happy to be able to do that because it's really so it's aim and there are different ways obviously to incorporate Montessori in in our life and definitely my daughter went to mainstream but I definitely believes that uh, she's still a Montessori child in her own way. She went to the early years and was totally, you know, uh, you know, in a prepared environment, we exposed to many Montessori materials and to that outside world in the early years. And we still, you know, want her to be creative and uh, have a free spirit. Obviously, we can see the influence, you know, like you when you were nine years old and had to do worksheets and, you know, listen to a teacher and so on. We can feel that influence, but I believe that parents have a great influence on their children. So when, when they start to understand uh, about how to respect the child and the children's needs, uh, even if the children have to go to mainstream education, you know, they will, they will be, I think, still be creative and, you know, with a greater chance to be self-disciplined and to fulfill the potentials as they grow. Yeah. So, yeah, my other question was about what do you think are different between homeschooling and the classroom? And I think you kind of have answered that yeah. as you were talking. <laughs> Unless you have something else to add about that question. No, I think that covers it. Um, it's just different for everyone. Every family is unique and needs to make their own path. And I feel like there's nothing wrong with learning while you're doing it. Uh, so, the biggest thing for me is as a Montessori, I can tell you the difference as a Montessori teacher versus a homeschooling parent uh, is that <laughs> as a teacher, I, uh, you know, we, we go and we get trained in something very specific. Um, we learn how to do our lessons in a really specific way. Uh, we practice. And I feel like when we work in the classroom, you get the opportunity of working with one child after another. And some of your lessons are gonna be dynamic and awesome. And sometimes you're gonna miss it completely with the child and the child is not gonna be interested. And you're, you're not gonna have this magical, wonderful lesson. 
And so I think sometimes parents think that teachers can just pull off these wonderful lessons every single time. And it's because we, we practice so much, we have the opportunity to fail, uh, you know, with, our, with, these, with our lessons over and over and over and to refine them and get better and better and better at teaching them in the classroom so that we can be pretty consistent by the time we have like, I don't know, three to five years of experience in the classroom. Now as a homeschooler, you don't get the opportunity to practice over and over and over. You are in a different journey and your journey begins when your child is a baby uh, and you first start this whole parenting thing. And I always tell parents, no one tells you how to parent a newborn. Uh, and, and even if they did, you still wouldn't know what it felt like and, and uh, how to do it right for your child until you have one. And so for, for me, homeschooling is just a continuation of parenting. So you start, you, you try something, if it doesn't work, you try something else. If that doesn't work, you learn from your mistakes and you try again. And as you do this with your own child, you get to know your child better and better. So even though you don't have the same kind of training as Montessori teachers do, and the ability to practice that one lesson over and over and over until you've got your method down, you have a different opportunity to work with one same child uh, and to know that child very, 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 very well. And so I think sometimes your, your guesses can be uh, more on target because you know your child better from the beginning. You've been working with your child since, um, you know, they we were first learning when they were very, very little. And so when you're homeschooling, it's no different. You're still parenting. Uh, you're just parenting a child who's a little bit older than the child was last year, and then a little bit older than the child was last year. Um, and as the children change, you change your teaching with them. Uh, and so that's, I think, for me, the most humbling thing and different thing about being a homeschool parent as opposed to a teacher in the classroom. And it, I think that that can make homeschoolers feel like they don't know what they're doing, really. Uh, and that I would encourage them to lean into that feeling and to say, you know what? None of us really know what we're doing with our own children because that's how parenting is. Uh, and so mm -hmm. what's the difference between teaching your child how to eat properly at a table or teaching your child how to do a math problem? There's really not that much difference if you are uh, coming at it from the heart and the same, with the same mindset of respect uh, for them and relationship coming over the actual academic lesson itself. Yeah, I really like the way you say that. <laughs> okay, so something else that I was interested to talk to um, with you about is, you know, more often, I don't know if it's more, uh, most of the case nowadays, but many mothers try to run a business as well as being at home with their young children. And for some homeschoolers, obviously, it's meant sometimes that they do need to have a job to afford to stay yeah. at home. So they try to run their own business. And uh, I have another guest coming tomorrow with his, who is in that situation as well. You know, she's homeschooling yeah. a daughter with three and she runs her own business. And so, yeah, but again, I wanted to know, you know, oh, do you do it all? <laughs> what would be your tips to be? Obviously, your children are older, so I'm a bit, that's, obviously, they go to school, so ever sometimes during the day when they're not with me, and it's easier when they grow up, because you can say, okay, you're going to, you know, keep yourself busy, do your stuff in your bedroom, or read your book yeah. while I'm in school, or something like that. But when they are younger, maybe you were not running a business, so it might not be that relevant, but, you know, just, to share a bit of your tips <laughs> to be able to handle it all as a family, you know, with a business that takes your time, sure. you know, during the day, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right. So for the, here's, here's what I've learned <laughs> about homeschooling. First of all, homeschooling full time, uh, and also about running a business, whether part time or full time or just a little bit. Um, so, a very wise person before I even really started the monetary side, you know, I, I did this as I guess what you would say is like a hobby for a long time. I was felt like I was more volunteering and I wasn't earning an income. 
Uh, and so my mindset was really different when I wasn't charging people for my work. <laughs> and once I started <laughs> charging people for my work, I started to feel a lot more pressure uh, to make sure that I was fulfilling my commitments. Um, and then I started to, to have some feelings of guilt about am I able to serve my family with as much heart and as much presence uh, when I've got this other blossoming part of, of my side, my career that is also important to me. And so I get this question a whole lot from homeschoolers about like, how do, how do you do it all? Uh, and, the, and the best answer I ever gotten actually was in a Facebook group of other Montessori entrepreneurs. Um, someone brought up and said, you know what? Uh, you can't really do it. You can't do it well. Uh, either your business is like awesome and you, you're putting all your energy into that or your homeschooling is awesome and you're putting all your energy into that. There's like no balance to be able to be achieved. Uh, and I found that that's very true. And so I personally have tried to just lean into it sometimes. Uh, like while I was writing these books, um, my husband had to step up and do take on some more of the homeschooling that he was used to on the weekends um, because I was writing on the weekends and not available. Um, and so, and my mother came and helped us sometimes during that time period. And that is the only way that I was able to write those two books in one year was to have that outside support. Um, so I would tell people who are trying to do both that it's normal to have these feelings of guilt. If you're experiencing feelings of guilt for being away from your family, even though you're still at home, you're mentally away or mentally thinking about the business stuff while you're with your children. That I think is just a normal part of, of life of doing this. Um, and the other thing is that homeschooling is a full-time job. Like taking care of children, especially young children, when you are home with them, or if you are a homeschooler and you're not sending them to school for that seven hours during the day, it's a full-time job. Uh, so when you add a business to it, you're working two jobs. <laughs> and I think that sometimes as parents, um, maybe especially as, as full-time caregivers who are at home with our parent, with our children, we tend to think of being a parent and being in charge of their care is not a job uh, and not something that, um, that adding a business element to isn't like adding a whole nother job, but it really is. And if there are if there are times that you need to work on your business, uh, what I do strongly recommend that people do is to think about whether there are ways that they can get in a little bit of extra child care, uh, whether it's from a partner that they live with, or whether it's from a family member who can come help, help out now and then, uh, or whether it's another homeschooling parent. I know that there are situations where other homeschooling parents are also working part-time, or, um, and they're able to kind of trade off childcare. Um, but if you don't have that kind of extra childcare support, you need to know that you are working two jobs <laughs> and it's not any different than anybody else who has two jobs, who works a job on the weekend and works, you know, a 40 hour work week during the work week. Um, and so you have to come at it with that mindset, not just like, I'm going to start making some money now and I'll squeeze it into my day with my children, but like I'm taking on another job because it's important to me and I'm going to make time for it. Uh, and then I think it's really important to schedule in where you're going to take time to do it, where you're going to fit it in and to make sure that you have enough support and resources um, to be able to manage both things. Um, and I would never say that it's an easy thing. I think that it can be very fulfilling. I think that staying home with, with children full time and not having a career is exhausting, <laughs> um, just mm -hmm. like parenting is exhausting. Um, and so I think that having a focus, a business focus can make us feel very empowered and it can be very important to some of us to be able to have something outside um, to work on that's just ours. And for me, for a long, long time, while my children were very little and I wasn't bringing in an income, it was studying Maria Montessori. And, and that was like mm. what was bringing me the most joy. I did a lot of personal research. Uh, that was when I created Montessori One in the very beginning. Um, and that was personally fulfilling. And so if you're adding a work at home element to your life, I think that 
you need to do a lot of soul searching and also time time searching to make sure that you can fit these things into the schedule and understand that it's not going to always be balanced. Um, sometimes one thing is going to be more important and sometimes another thing is going to be important. So it's not it's not easy and I wouldn't um, I would never tell people that you should do it because it's an easy way of life. <laughs> But I don't think that an easy way of life is necessarily the most fulfilling way either. I think that it's important to follow your heart. And if if you need to bring in a business element and it fills your soul, then you should go for it. Um, just make sure that you have the support that you need. I'm personally right now very, very attached to my planner. <laughs> I, I cannot do anything business straight unless I write it down. And it has to be in pencil. Um, I don't do an online planner. I use a, a you know, old school planner, uh, and I do that with the homeschooling too. And if I write it down and I make my plans, then it's much, much more likely to, to happen. And I also document still what I'm doing with my own children because I feel like uh, when I'm very, very busy and I'm working on multiple projects, sometimes I feel like I'm not doing enough with them. But when then I actually look at what I've documented, I realize that they're doing okay. And, and I actually am doing a whole, a whole lot more than I thought that I was. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very important what you said about uh, having the support. And I think that's important as well for just for parents, even if we don't have an extra business, if we are stay at home mom, uh, as you said, parenting is hard and we do need to get the support. And sometimes the family is not there and we can find that support still, I think. Yes. Many other parents are lonely as well and want that support. So if we connect with those other parents in our area, we will find, I think, like-minded parents if we just have the courage to say, okay, I need to have someone to help me at home. You know, shall we do a play date when we help each other? And uh, these kind of things are just a babysitting exchange or these kind of yeah. things if you don't have the family around. And that's something that I really encourage all the parents uh, I work with to do and to really try to reach out for other parents, even if they don't have, you know, their own parents around or their family. I'm sure that there are other moms in the area who are lonely and who just wait for someone to tell them, you know, let's become my friends and we can to help each other and yeah. cook together and so on. And that's something you said that you were a literally leader. And that's something that when I used to go to the Rich League, uh, those ladies were like probably 50 years old. Um, oh. And they said that the, the, three, the three leaders were, were friends in the children were little babies that all, all they met. And they used to do this kind of uh, tidy up play date. Yes. So they were going in turn into each other's house and they were cooking, they were doing the laundry together. So they were like one playing with the children, uh, chatting, you know, they were chatting, drinking coffee and doing the laundry in one house. And then they were going to the other house two days after and they were like helping to uh, batch cooking and so and then they were yeah. helping each other so much. And a few years later, when we moved to London, um, it happens that my neighbors was friends as well. And so we become super good friends and we were, you know, all the time helping each other. And that was my best years as a parent is to have when I had her and she had me and we were like cooking for each other, minding each other's ch children to be able to run our own business, by the way, at the time. And so on. And, you know, I don't think I would have enjoyed that much the early years without her because it was so helpful. And obviously because of our situation, because we were both expats, I think it was like a bit automatic to rely more on other people. But I um and I felt a bit like ten years ago that I was probably the only one in the situation because I was an expat. But when you talk with people, you know, even if your family is close by, sometimes you don't you don't see eye to eyes because you have such a different parenting styles and you cannot all your parents still work because you know we work later and later so your parents might not be retired and so that's the same I think for every single parent nowadays we do need to yeah. reach out yeah. and ask for support even if we don't have a business. <laughs> but I think the benefit also is that when our children see us enjoying our work and putting value mm -hmm. on it I think that it's very very healthy for them and so even though I've, I've gone back and forth experiencing these little feelings of guilt, like I'm doing something just for me, 
um, and for our family and not necessarily for them uh, 100%. Um, I still have been hearing them. They talk about my website a lot and they make suggestions for me when they see something that might go along with Montessori. They might suggest like, um, mom, you might want to put that on <laughs> on your website. Or maybe you should tell other parents that this is a good thing. Um, and so I know that they're definitely seeing uh, and proud of the, the value that I put on my own work. And so that also makes it worth it for me. And I, I hope that they see me enjoying it so much that someday they will want to do something that they love themselves, not, not just for money, um, but something that really fills their spirit. Absolutely. So there was a question that I'm asking every guest is, you know, do you have a favorite Montessori recruit? I hope you have time to prepare one for me that you really like. <laughs> I do. My favorite Montessori quote, um, I could read it to you. And it's the one that starts with, let the children be free. Do you know that one? Yes, go ahead. Okay. It comes from the discovery of the child. I don't know if anybody else has brought it up, but it goes, let the children be free, encourage them, let them run outside when it is raining, let them remove their shoes when they find a puddle of water, and when the grass of meadows is damp with dew, let them run on it and trample it with their bare feet. Let them rest peacefully when a tree invites them to sleep beneath its shade. Let them shout and laugh when the sun wakes them in the morning as it wakes every living creature that divides its day between waking and sleeping. And so that it really sums up for me Montessori philosophy as a whole. You know, let the children, children have this natural instinct toward joy and to seek out sensory experiences, especially those little children who are just starting to explore their world. And so often we try to mold them and shape them and we don't need to. We just need to nurture what's already there inside their little spirits. <laughs> and so that's oh. my favorite. That's a great quote. <laughs> I'm, I'm very like that to hear every guest best quote. And it's all you asked so far. Everybody has chosen a different quote, so it's great. Yeah. So, we're going to have a little collection of favorite Montessori quotes from the Montessori community out there. So, that's great. And I'm going to ask all the members of this group if they want to share a quote at, a, at some point. Yeah, we can make a book of best Montessori quotes after that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my last question for you tonight would be to you know, we were talking about the fact that parenting is hard, right? And and very demanding mm -hmm. and uh, you find something that fulfills you as you know as an individual not just as a mom so would you like to share as well if you have some tips for self-care for your own self-care maybe what you were doing when they were little and always with you maybe that's a bit different uh, what you can do you know that they are a bit more grown up but yes self-care is so important and we cannot sure. need to take care of that right sure. You know, I think it's different for everyone. Um, everyone has something that keeps their spirit calm and keeps their their mind engaged. And for me, it is 100% time outside in nature. Uh, when I find myself indoors too often without getting out for a walk and uh, in an experience in some kind of wooded or you know just out out in nature it could be for me it's the either the beach or the woods or just out in the grass walking somewhere out hiking if i don't get that in <laughs> every single week i find myself stressed uh, and not centered and i find myself more snippy with my children um, and just not not as whole and relaxed as I need to be. And so, and, and the thing is, it for me, my self-care doesn't necessarily need to be time away from my children. I, 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 it surprises people when they find out how little time I actually, how, how often I'm actually with them, both during the day and weekends. I'm with them a whole lot. And I think we have this idea of me time this self-care me time is time where a person needs to be away from the family and by themselves. And for me, that's not it for me. 
what's for me is whether my family is with me or not, I need to get out and breathe fresh air and to be away from my house and out in nature. Um, and whether it's a walk in the park, three hours, uh, just sitting in the grass while my children play at the playground, that can do it for me. Um, taking walks is the best. Hiking, um, I just love it. It's just, it's what I do to help myself relax. And so I know that that is not something, and, it, and there are all these studies that show how good nature is for us, all of us, you know, not just me. Um, but I feel like um, everyone needs to, to find that thing that makes them feel peaceful and calm. I know another person whose, whose thing is baths. <laughs> Every night it's a bath and it is what relaxes and calms her and keeps that consistency, keeps her sane. Uh, and able to be restored in the next morning. And so that's, that's her thing. It's not my thing. My thing is out getting out and hiking. Um, and so I think it is very individual and unique, but whatever it is that makes your spirit feel calm, that fills your soul, that makes your heart beat more slowly instead of feeling more anxious, what brings that level of anxiety down for you if you can incorporate that and make that a regular part of what you do, um, then that's going to help you to be able to take care of your children better too, because you'll be taking care of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's nice that you said that me time doesn't have to be by yourself. You know, it's not mandatory that that me time should be that specific self-care that you choose for you and definitely self-care in the earlier as a parent can be done with our children. There are so many things that we can do for self-care with our children and incorporate that self-care in our everyday life and just five minute breathing, you know, in the kitchen is self-care sometimes for me. Yeah. Deep breathing. And uh, when my children were very little, um, with my daughter, you know, we had a bath together and that was my self-care. I yeah. used to stay in the bath for so long with her, so she was playing, obviously, she was with me, but, you know, I was putting my special uh, bath bubbles and stuff, and that was my self-care, and that was with her, and um, I trained as a yoga teacher for children, and so for a long time we had a family yoga session, uh, so I was working, but it was um, us time together as well. It was a yeah. very good time for us to connect as a family. And uh, that's something that we enjoyed for uh, like uh, a year or two together as a family and uh, a self-care routine for everybody in the family, including my husband. So yeah, we need to find what works for us, definitely. And with nothing, nothing should be prescribed, right? <laughs> Good. Well, it was a very a pleasure for me to chat with you. I've learned a lot about you and, you know, about Montessori. We learn a lot every day. And I'm just going to wait to see if we have some viewers who have specific questions for you while you, you're there. You also remember this group. So if they watch this as a replay, because obviously the time might not be convenient for everybody, depending on where they are. Uh, you will be on this group, so if you want to pop in and answer some of the questions, then we pop in comments, and you are welcome to do that, obviously. So yeah. just wait a few minutes. Let's see if we have any viewers who want to ask a question to Aubrey, obviously. And I will obviously put all the links. I think your next course will be about potty training. <laughs> I kind of have received an email about potty training, so that's an interesting one one that I definitely would like, would have loved to take when my children were little. <laughs> so it was so easy to put it straight, you know, I did that like three days. <laughs> like, yeah, great, it worked well. And the second one was like, my God, what's going on here? <laughs> I for a year and I waited until he was ready. I stopped, you know, I did the same method for my first. And then when I noticed that nothing was working, I said, okay, we're not going to do anything for as long as it takes. And you just yeah. I do it. When it comes to pot, when it comes to helping your child learn how to use the potty, I think a lot of parents have a lot of fear about it. And if we can take that fear okay. away, for some parents, they're too afraid to even jump into it. You know, they want to keep their children in diapers um, for too long because they're afraid to not use the diapers and to to go diaperless. Uh, and so I think that sometimes the fear of parents on that side can prevent children from being able to learn how to use the potty earlier. But on the other side, 
I think that we can also experience some anxiety on the earlier side too and say, oh, when is this gonna happen? And why won't, why won't my child do it already? You know, I, um, I'm, I'm ready for it. You know, why aren't they doing it right now? Uh, and how can I make them learn how to use the potty <laughs> right now so that it's not their family problem? And I think that on that end too, it's all about fear, right? Like the fear that our children will stay in those diapers for a long, long time. And so I think the approach that Nicole and I use in the course is very similar to the ones that you read in, like in my books. Um, just patience with our children calming down of our own nerves and just being open to the possibilities, being respectful as our children kind of navigate this process. Because no child is going to learn how to use the toilet in exactly the same way at the exact same time. No. <laughs> and that's the problem with a lot of these potty training books is they want to give a very prescriptive approach to like, do this on this day and do this on this day and then boom, your child will be potty trained, right? Uh, or they give like a very specific time when your child must be potty trained uh, or it will be too late. Uh, and I feel like if we can take a more relaxed approach to it um, and just give our child the opportunities, just like in anything else with Montessori, they'll learn how to do it on their own while, while we're supporting them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so I, I love pottying with the little children. I love the diapering too. I know a lot of parents are scared of the poopy diapers, but I think it's a really nice opportunity to be able to get very intimate with your child. And while you're wiping their little bottom, you can be, you know, saying little, little rhymes and talking to them and looking in their little eyes and kind of having this communication time. I think that it's nice. Um, and I think that people as a general, our culture, we were real uptight about anything that involves pee or poop. <laughs> and I think Absolutely. <laughs> and just say, you know what, you guys are wrong. This whole pottying thing is can be fun and relaxing and diapers are cute and little bottoms are cute. So just lean into it. And then I think that's, a, that's the aspect of child rearing that I think I've forgotten <laughs> about. I feel that I'm not competent, you know, to help parents with potty training because it's like, what is that? <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember why I did it. You know, it's felt it's felt that it was easy for my first, not that easy for the second one. But ultimately, they, well, you know, they are potty trained. Yeah. <laughs> That's a bit all I all I can remember about it. You know. So I don't think any I don't see any questions coming up. So we'll see if that comes when there is a replay and obviously you there. So just enjoy the rest of the. Uh, interviews that we're going to have all week and yeah. it was a pleasure to have you so thank you so much for coming in and joining in just stay two minutes after we have uh, end the broadcast like that we can uh, just discuss uh, uh, you know the technical side of it and yeah it was a pleasure to have you thank you so much well thank you so much for having me all right bye bye okay